The stories shared on It Takes Balls are unique to the individual sharing. Always speak with your trusted medical provider for treatment options specific to you. Welcome back to It Takes Balls. Today I'm joined by Garrett Jenkins. He works on airplanes in the military. Garrett, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. So you have a bit of a disclaimer that you have to... Yeah, yeah. so any thoughts or opinions mentioned by myself are my own and they do not reflect upon the United States Air Force or the United States Department of Defense. Totally so fair. That's all a disclaimer. So that's all kind of set out, so... No, that's perfect. That's perfect. You're the one that went through it anyway, so it's all your, all your story. <laughs> So tell me a little bit about yourself. You're 21. Um, yeah, I'm 21. I'm a couple of days. I'll turn 22. So um, kind of crazy whirlwind. Uh, I was diagnosed with testicular cancer in December 2020, um, kind of mid pandemic, but I was overseas at that time. I just moved out to Colorado now. Um, so it was being separated from family and not having family over there and everything. It was just a whirlwind and everything, but definitely blessed uh, to get through and everything like that. And thank you again for having me on here and sharing my story. I did not know that you were overseas. Maybe I missed that in your, in your story, but we'll get to that. Let's start with the very beginning, um, how you were diagnosed. So I was applying for a commissioning program to become an officer in the air force. Um, obviously since I'm already in, I have thought I didn't have to go through a medical, uh, medical evaluation again, but of course I did. Um, I had this thing called a Verisil, which is for me, what is explained to me, I'm for this thing from a medical expert, but, um, it was just like a bag of worms and, uh, it was on my left left uh test or scrotum test school whatever um and the officer air force knew about it because i've had it since i was whatever eight years old or something like that and um so they told me to go see a urologist and lucky enough me me applying to that commissioning program ended up me being diagnosed i mean i did my self checks but i never really did anything other than that i just i'm invincible obviously i think everybody at that age thinks that they're invincible so um that's how i was diagnosed and uh, it moved pretty quickly so yeah. And that's good to hear that you were doing your self checks. I mean, I don't think a lot of people, I definitely wasn't doing it. So that's good to hear. Did I you- wasn't doing it as often. I wouldn't lie to you, but I mean, cause I, like I said, at 20 years old, you think you're invincible me and I was probably the best shape of my life. So cancer was the last thing on my mind to tell you the truth. So, yeah, I think that's the way it goes for all of us. Um, all right. So you were overseas when this happened. Yes, sir. Yeah. I was stationed in Okinawa, Japan, uh, at an air force base over there. Um, they had a naval hospital, luckily over there that had a urology clinic and that's how I had my orchiectomy and everything. So it, uh, like I said, it moved really quickly. I was diagnosed I think on December 8th and then like two, three days later, I was already had my orchiectomy and everything. And I didn't realize how severe, what a sphere it was or how important it was and kind of thing until he's like, yeah, you have your surgery two, three days. I'm like, Oh wow, this is, this is a pretty big deal. So, uh, it definitely was a, it was a shock. What was that like being over there? I mean, you mentioned you you were far away from your family. Yeah, so the time changed because my family's from the East Coast. So I think it was like 13, 14 hours. Um, they were ahead of me, or I was ahead of them, excuse me. And um, so trying to call them, it's like middle of the night. And I don't want to freak out my parents because it's the middle of the night, but I'm calling them like, hey, don't freak out. This is what the doctor thinks it is. I'm going to get my ultrasound now. Um, he said it very well could not be it. And then um, obviously it was it, so... Um, just going through all that and my parents, my parents wanted to be there for our me, but peak COVID, you couldn't get into the country or Japan. So it was, it was just crazy. I mean, I was thankful to have friends over there in Japan that actually helped support me and uh, actually took me to and from surgery and uh, took care of me and everything. So it was definitely a, uh, definitely a blessing. Yeah, man. I can't even imagine that. I yeah. mean, what were your, what were your parents like on the other end of the line? Well, my dad, um, my dad was kind of on the cooler end of it. Um, my mom's a nurse. So my mom's like, Oh my goodness, did they do this test to do this test to do this test? I'm like, I don't know, mom, <laughs> I was just told to do this. So, um, but my dad was kind of on the cooler end of it. Obviously, um, we were, uh, kind of we Christians or whatever. So we, um, I say just keep praying, just keep praying, keep believing and everything like that. And that's kind of what carried me through the entire ordeal, um, being so young, of course. So. Yeah. So you were in Okinawa, Japan, and you had your orchiectomy there. And then yep. you, what kind of treatment did you get after that? And was that, was it all in Japan or did you come back? So I went, I was in Japan and I, after like about two weeks after my orchiectomy, I went over to Walter Reed National Military Medical Center in Bethesda, Maryland. Um, so they TDY'd me or work tripped me over there, uh, sent me over there to do my, my kind of follow on treatment. We didn't know what it was because it did metastasize to my lymph nodes a little bit. They could tell, um, they didn't know necessarily how severe. So we went through the testings over there. 
And that's where they kind of laid it on the table was RPL and D or chemotherapy. And that kind of gave me the ball in my court. Um, I chose the RPN L and D. Um, my tumor markers went back down. So we thought that was the best option, um, especially being so young running through chemo. And then next thing you know, my tumor markers jumped back up and I kind of relapsed a little bit. And then they said, I'm sorry, we don't feel comfortable going in there and we don't know where it's at at this point. So we don't want to go in there, spread it around. So, uh, I went through three rounds of BEP, uh, chemo, uh, 21 day cycles. So it was, a uh, kind of a qu quick pace or whatever, but it definitely uh, felt like it dragged a little bit at the, in the time being. So when you were flying from Japan to uh, Maryland, how long is that flight? And what are you thinking? I mean, are you so, by yourself? Are you with other um, guys in the military? So it was, uh, it was actually a commercial flight. So um, I think it was, I had to fly from Okinawa to Tokyo and then Tokyo over to just a couple of layovers, whatever, but eventually to DC. And, um, of course I'm going through the, the thought process of, man, this is, you hear the word cancer it scares you, you know, of course it's, it's not a light word. Um, but it's just definitely, it was, it was a scary time. I was by myself, um, it was 13 hour flight straight. So, I mean, it was just, it was just a, a weird time and you're just always running through your head. Always. You try to take your mind off of it, but you can't, I mean, um, it's just, you, you, like I said, you get told you have cancer and it just, it completely scares you. So, um, it was just something that was in the back of my mind almost all the time. So. And this is post orchiectomy. I think you're the first person I've talked to who's flown after the orchiectomy. <laughs> so I mean, was there any kind of like pressure issue or anything on your incision or anything like that? Uh, luckily, no, I saw the skin glue and everything. But um, other than that, I was just, uh, I mean, I couldn't set a certain way because I knew how it was a little, a little sore or whatever. But honestly, I thought that it was gonna be a lot more sore after the orchiectomy. I was, I lived on the second floor of my dorm over there. And I mean, I was able to walk up the stairs, not, not fast, but I was able to walk up the stairs and everything. And, um, it was actually, it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. And all the stories I've heard, I was very thankful for that as well. So. Yeah. Talk more about your, um, the, you know, you said that you opted for the RPL and D at first and mm -hmm. then your tumor marker shot up. So delve into that a little bit deeper. So, um, I was doing, it was actually on my 21st birthday. I was over at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center. Happy birthday to me. Um, <laughs> doing, doing my, uh, my, uh, kind of pre-op blood work and scanning and everything just so they can kind of see where everything's at. And, um, I got a call from the doctor after he got the results and he's like, Hey, um, your tumor marker shot back up. They're higher than they were even whenever you had the tumor in you. So this isn't, this is not something that we need to mess with because it's, it's pretty serious at this point. And that, that definitely scared me. I mean, it went from a high of, oh, I'm just going to have this RPL and D. I didn't really want to because it was kind of a scary thing being split open. Um, but at the same time, too, it was, it was long-term effects less than the chemotherapy. So I was just ready to get the ball rolling and everything. And then once we, he, uh, the doctor told me that this is not the best best course of action, it definitely was a, it was a kind of a heartbreak kind of thing. And I was just ready for it to go. Then I had to wait another couple, couple of days, weeks, whatever, until I was able to start chemo. But... Um, once I started chemo, I was just ready to get it started. Even though chemotherapy sucks, it just is, I was ready to get it started. So is the chemo, is the, are they treating you through the Walter Reed or are you going somewhere private? I mean, I, I don't know much about military and I, I think you guys have good me uh, yeah. medical insurance. So, I mean, is this all military coverage yeah, yeah. and so, providers? Yeah. Yeah. So military, well, Walter Reed's kind of a weird one because it's, then that is the president's hospital in a sense. So, um, the president goes there, there's some civilian doctors and there's some military doctors. It's a very big, big hospital, probably the biggest one I've ever been to. And, um, they had their own cancer. It was actually a cancer center of excellence. So it was a very good place to be is the only one in the DOD. So, um, from what I was told, so it was a very good place to be. And it was all through them, all nurses and everything, um, civilians or uh, military members, but it was all on base there. So, are your parents anywhere close to Maryland and they were able to come see you there? Yeah. So my family's from Northern Virginia. So it's about an hour, hour and a half of, uh, drive to Walter Reed. And that's kind of was my big push to the doctor. I didn't really have much control of anything, but I was like, Hey, can I go to Walter Reed? Is there any possibility? And he's like, that's a great idea. Let's send you there uh, from a sport and everything. So my parents were there. Um, they obviously helped me through my cycles and everything. And then um, my sister's actually in the Air Force as well here in Colorado. She flew back and uh, helped me through a couple uh, cycles as well. And my mom came down from New York. So it was a, a team effort by my family. I'm definitely thankful for them. And uh, just like I said, it's, I can't thank them enough because going through that and just them being there and obviously just hold, not holding my hand, but taking care of me through it is uh, definitely 
definitely a blessing. So, yeah, no, I agree. That's, that's so important. During your uh, your chemo, your BEP, did you have any side effects or anything? Um, not during, obviously I, oh, I, I will take that back. I had a little bit of tinnitus, the ringing in the ears, uh, during it. And it was a lot more severe than I still get it now. Um, I didn't have the pins and needles in my fingers until after, I think a couple months after, but I still have that now. Um, kind of as just a trade off though. I mean, I definitely would rather have that than have the cancer inside me. So, I mean, it's, uh, definitely just going through that. And, um, Obviously, I had I, the weirdest thing. I never, I guess I had an allergic reaction to some of it. Uh, the bee, the bleomycin or whatever, it gave me like kind of hives or whatever in my arm. So they uh, gave me medicine, hydrocortisone for that. Um, but it was kind of weird. It kind of like broke out my arms and everything. Nowhere else except my arms and my back. But it was kind of weird. But. Yeah. Now that you, I mean, you mentioning that makes me feel better because I had some kind of like, they diagnosed me as having um, shingles. But I had this weird thing that came up on my, like top of my back that mm-hmm. was kind of like, deep i mean it was a deep little yeah it was i still kind of have the scars from it too it was, it was kind of obviously it was itchy i didn't think anything of it. I was like man i'm just scratching my arms and extra scarred up my arms a little bit but um it was it was kind of crazy to think that i never thought that that drug would do that to you but yeah um did they offer you the regimen of top of science of splatin versus bep or did they um have a preference to bep um, they kind of said something about, uh, about the, um, the EP, I didn't really push it cause they said it had to be four rounds. And of course I'm not, I'm not, like I said, not anything in the medical. I was like three rounds sounds better than four. So, um, that's what kind of opted towards the EP. Um, so basically how my cycle worked was, it was a five day stretch on Monday. I would get my B E N P my bleomycin, the top side and cisplatin. And then days, Tuesday through Friday, I would just get the EP, the top side and uh, the cisplatin. And then on Monday, the next week, I'll get the bleomycin only. Then the Monday after that, I'll have bleomycin only. So it was kind of back to back. It was weird. The, the week, the five day stretch was definitely the, the killer of it. But um, other than that, it was just a long drilling, drilling week or whatever. But what year was all this? Because you said you're about to turn 22 and my note says 21. So now I'm thrown off on yeah. years. So December no. 8th was your. December 8th of 2020 was my, was my diagnosis. Uh, or Dece- December 8th overseas, because we're a day ahead, uh, December 7th in the States. Um, and then December 10th was when I had or- my orchidectomy 2020. I went back to the States, and that's when it turned 2021. And um, on my 21st birthday is when I was in, uh, in t- and that doing my pre-op stuff, and they told me, hey, we can't do this anymore kind of thing. So, Okay, so you're just about a year out from, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's uh, pretty crazy. I was, uh, was it April 26th was my uh, date that I was told I was in remission. So it's coming up quick. It doesn't feel like it's been a year. It doesn't even feel like anything's happened to tell you the truth, but lots of, ha- lots have happened since, uh, since that time. So. Yeah, definitely. Um, in survivorship. I mean, how has that been for you being in the military? You're you able to do your, your normal duties. Yeah. So I'm still obviously in surveillance. I'm the same as everybody else surveillance. I'm overseas. I was getting seen by military doctors, but here that I'm in the States, I'm getting seen by civilian doctors now. Um, kind of the same thing. It's just, uh, every two months, three months, I get blood work and CTs every six, seven months or whatever it is. Um, so it's just that, um, other than that, it's just, it was kind of crazy cause I never realized how big testicular cancer was. Um, my gym teacher, football coach in high school, he, uh, he, uh, was diagnosed with testicular cancer and I reached out to him. I was like, Hey, what's going on? Like what, what's, what's the deal about it and everything. He kind of gave me the rundown. And then once I made like my remission post or whatever on, on Facebook, they, uh, that's how everyone reached out to me. I was like four or five, six different guys um, just reached out. I was like, Hey, this happened to me too. And it just kind of shared their story or whatever. So it was definitely, definitely weird. I never knew how big it was. And that's kind of the reason I want to, I wanted to get on this podcast and try to raise awareness for it because I mean, there could be a guy in my shoes that, you know I mean? You could be thinking the same thing, but. Yeah, no, definitely. And we're glad to have you um, being in the military and working with all those men and women. Um, I mean, are they, you said they're all supportive over there and are they continuing to, are you continuing to spread awareness with, within the, your oh, group yeah. of guys? Yeah. So yeah, a lot of the guys, I, I mean, there are some women in the maintenance career field, but it's, it's a majority of men, I mean, uh, career field, um, hats off to the women that are in there. I couldn't deal with the, some of the men in there, but, um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, as uh, they're all supportive. I mean, obviously, it's not a joke, but I mean, it's, it's definitely something that's, uh, something that I don't, don't try to joke about, but at the same time too, I mean, 
I have one nut, so it's, it's not that, um, but yeah, they're very supportive. They're very, uh, very forg- forgiving of my work hours and stuff. Cause I mean, I have to go to appointments a lot kind of thing for my surveillance. So they're very, uh, understanding of that and everything. So, um, it's definitely, definitely supportive and I'm just trying to raise awareness for it. It was kind of hard cause I just moved from Japan trying to re- reestablish roots here in Colorado. But, um, yeah, it's definitely, definitely something I want to raise awareness for because the, something doctor explained to me was 15 to 35, I believe is the, is the prime age for testicular cancer is what he told me. And, um, that's the prime age of that is the military and military men. So it's crazy because my doctor told me, he's like, yeah, I just took, had an orchiectomy last week, but you don't hear about it kind of thing. So that's kind of what I'm kind of trying to step out there and do is, Hey, I know it's something very personal. I'm going through it. I went through it, but it's not something to mess with. Cause if you guys don't have your spread, your lymph nodes or even farther than that, and you just have the orchiectomy and just surveillance after that, that's a blessing in itself. So it's just trying to raise, raise awareness and everything for it. What are your, do you have any plans for the future with, um, spreading awareness, any kind of things um, you're planning on doing just fundraisers for Facebook or whatever? Yeah, just probably that for now. Um, they have this thing called the wounded warriors program. Um, not the wounded warriors project. That's what you see on the back of shirts and everything like that. It's kind of a different, um, but the wounded warrior program is, a. Uh, something that's throughout the entire military and everything you're kind of can be an amb- ambassador and you talk to different people and kind of thing kind of raise awareness for not specifically my disease but any disease and then that kind of gives me a foot in the door and be like hey testicular cancer is very prominent in these ages that are very prominent in the military so um it's definitely that's probably going to be the route that i go for now so you said you're an air force yes sir yeah yeah you know, B, I don't know if you know BJ Lang, the first episode of this podcast is also yeah. Air Force. Have you guys talked? Yeah, yeah. yeah I haven't talked to him, no, but I, I have uh, I have watched the, all the podcasts from here um, before me and everything. So, um, yeah, I did see his, and that's pretty neat that I'm not the only military guy that goes through it. So, yeah, I'll connect you guys, too, if you want. That would be awesome. That would be awesome. I appreciate it. Um, now, one thing that for me, like when, when I was first diagnosed um, – the one thing I was worried about was having kids. Is that something that's on your radar in the future? Yeah, definitely is going to be on my radar. Um, luckily enough, I mean, part of the RPN, RPN LND, um, they said that I couldn't with the ejaculatory response or whatever wouldn't be there. So they had me sperm bank before. Um, luckily I didn't have to have the, the RPN LND, so it wouldn't have that effect, I guess, but I also had chemotherapy. So that has a negative effect as well. So I do have it on, on file, I guess, but, um, it's uh, definitely something I would like in the future, but it's just uh, kind of too early. Now I can be a dad now. It's, it's way too early for that. So <laughs> no, no, I hear you. I hear you. Is there anything else that you want to add? Any, any doctors you want to shout out or anything? Um, obviously the whole team at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center, the John P. Murtha Cancer Center of Excellence, um, all the doctors through there, uh, the nurses through there, the nurses were great. They uh, helped me through everything. I was in my doctor, Dr. Dow, and back in uh, Okinawa. I don't think he's there anymore, but he moved uh, somewhere else because he's in the military as well. Um, Dr. Chestnut at Walter Reed and uh, Dr. Park at Walter Reed. And of course, my pa- parents and family and friends, um, everyone that supported me through it. Um, I really appreciate it. And just thank you again for having me and telling me, uh, give me a chance to tell my story. Do you have any lasting side effects? Um, like I said, it's just kind of ringing the ears. Um, other than that, it's just obviously, I mean, my pins and needles and the fingers, but it's weird. It comes and goes. It doesn't, um, it's not like it's constant. Um, sometimes the hearing goes days without it and then it starts ringing again or my hands or fingers are like, or my toes and fingers are, um, just start happening again. So it's, it's really weird how it happened or how it happens, but it's kind of sporadic. It's not constant, I guess. So I wouldn't, know if that's long term but it's kind of long term i guess so did you lose your hair during chemo i did yeah i was completely bald it was kind of funny because my dad uh my dad's bald so him and i were pretty much twins everyone's like oh they guys pretty much look exactly the same <laughs> it's pretty funny it was pretty funny so was that a, a shock to you at all like losing your um, hair were you kind of prepared for it mentally um i kind of I mean, I would say I knew that it was going to happen. I'm, uh, the, the nurses kind of gave me the rundown. I was like, hey, this, these drugs make your hair fall out. It's like, okay, not a big deal. Maybe it won't happen for me. It ended up happening. And that I didn't feel sick before, but then once my, my hair started falling out, that's kind of like the visual thing. And people started like side-eyeing you a little bit and knowing you're sick and everything. Obviously, I didn't go out a lot because of the pandemic and being immunocompromised. But um, it was still something that it was kind of uh, – 
I don't know how to say it. it was like a kind of a mental thing. It's like, you look in the mirror and you're like, wow, I'm, I'm sick now. I have, don't have any hair or anything. So it was definitely, uh, definitely that, but I mean, it's growing back. It's still thin now, but it's, it's still growing back. So it's, it's uh, definitely a blessing that he even came back. So, yeah, looks great. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Talk more about going through it during the pandemic, because that's another thing that, um, a lot of the guys more recently have had to deal with. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, my parents jobs, obviously they want one worked at a County office. My mom was a nurse, so she's kind of front lines up there, um, in New York, but obviously there, it was kind of right as the vaccine started rolling out. So they were all vaccinated and everything. And, um, my dad of course is works outside and everything. So he wasn't really wasn't around as many people, but, um, it's definitely, uh, was hard because I mean, even a simple cold could have been a bad news for anybody. I had to check my temperature every day. Mm-hmm. I just didn't have a temperature. And if I did, they would send me right to the ER. So, um, it's kind of was hard going through that. And I didn't really do anything except sit in my house and just kind of relax. Obviously I didn't really want to do much at that point. Um, going through, I had obviously the, the sickness and, and everything or the, the, I'm sorry. Uh, um, having the, uh, guess the, I don't even know how to say it, tell you the truth, like just not feeling just the weakness, I guess. And, um, that comes along with the chemotherapy and it was just, uh, it was hard kind of going through that. But, um, like I said, my, my family, uh, definitely took care of me and, uh, just didn't ma- made me feel like I wasn't alone kind of thing. Cause sometimes it did feel like I was alone because I mean, I'm the only one that's going through this and everybody else leaves for work, has to go to work real quick. And then uh, here I am by myself at the house and I'm just like, man, this sucks. So, yeah. Um, do you notice any, like, cause I know bleomycin and obviously neither of us are doctors. We, yeah. we know that, but, um, bleomycin I know affects the lungs and I assume like what you do is probably pretty intense or no. Um, I wouldn't say so. No, I just do sheet metal on, on plants. Okay. So it's like, it's just, I wouldn't say it's intense. Um, I don't know if it's the altitude, um, cause the altitude here is way higher than it was in Okinawa. I think I'm sitting at like 6,000 feet here. Okay. Okinawa is sitting like bare minimum on the, on the ocean. So, um, I'm not, not shortness of breath. I didn't experience any after whenever I was back in Virginia, then went back to ok- Okinawa and then coming here. Um, I didn't feel anything. And then once I started here, so I equate it to the, to the altitude, but, um, it's definitely something that I always keep my eye on. And after I get a cut acclimated or whatever, I'm definitely keeping my eye on. Cause I mean, it's definitely scary just to hear it's kind of like the nervousness of going to your surveillance. Like, is it back? What's, what's next kind of thing, but I'm definitely blessed enough and thankful enough that it's, uh, that it's uh, not coming back so far. Yeah. It could be the altitude. Yeah, sure. definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Cause that's one thing I've noticed with myself is that not that I was ever in shape before, but, um, <laughs> I'm definitely not in shape now. I'm a shape. Yeah. Not yeah. in shape. Yeah. That's the thing is, uh, I've been trying to work back into shape cause I was, like I said, I was in the best shape of my life before chemo or before my diagnosis and here I am whatever a year later. And it's still, it's like, I'm trying to work back up to it because even I took a run during chemo. I don't know what crossed my mind. I was like, let's go take a run. I went to take a run and that was probably the worst decision I made because I was over there hacking up, uh, just everything it was, it was horrible. But, um, during chemo, that was definitely, definitely something, but I, that was not the last and only run <laughs> that I ever did when I was in chemo. So, um, <laughs> after that, it was, uh, just trying to work it back into it. And of course, so. Well, shout out to you for trying to run. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. <laughs> Is there anything else that you want to add that we didn't talk about? I think that's it. Honestly, like I said, thank you again for having me on. And of course, doing this podcast to raise awareness for testicular cancer. And of course, the foundation for raising awareness as well. Sweet. Well, I, it's been my pleasure to have you on. And, and thank you so much for your service. Yeah, I appreciate that. For more information, visit testiscancer.org. You can also follow us on social media at Testis Cancer. We're on Facebook at Testicular Cancer Awareness Foundation.